हेलो फ्रेंड्स वेलकम टू द नीट पीजी स्पेशल दम लगा के हईशा सीरीज ऑफ आकाश पीजी प्लस द टॉपिक फॉर टुडेज डिस्कशन इज जस्टेशन डायबिटीज मेलाइटिस एंड हाइपरटेंशन इन प्रेगनेंसी सो लेट्स स्टार्ट विच ऑफ द फॉलोइंग इज फॉल्स रिगार्डिंग द मैनेजमेंट ऑफ डायबिटीज इन प्रेगनेंसी ओके सो लेट्स गो थ्रू द सेलेंट फीचर्स फर्स्ट इन डायबिटीज इफ देर इज अ मैक्रोजोमिक बेबी मोर देन फोर पॉइंट फाइव के जी वॉट डू वी हैव टू लुक फॉर शोल्डर डिस्टोशियर सो विल यू गो फॉर अजेर इन सेक्शन ऑन नॉट देर टू वेरी शार्प गाइडलाइन फॉर दिस इफ द मदर इज डायबिटिक and she has a macrosomic baby cesarean section is preferred and you will go ahead with that but if the baby is just macrosomic more than 4.5 kg and the mother is not diabetic right neither over diabetes or gestational diabetes you will go ahead with the vaginal delivery okay so only when the baby is more than 4.5 kg and the mother is diabetic both these conditions then only you will go for a cesarean section how do you manage diabetes in pregnancy this is also very important exam point start folic acid 4 mg till 13 weeks it is not 4 microgram it is 4 mg till 13 weeks aim for the fasting blood sugar to be less than 95 one hour postprandial less than 140 two hours less than 120 hba 16 is kept at less than 6% if the hba 1c is more than 10% then there is very high risk of congenital malformations now measure hba 1c in the first trimester you also measure the renal function test retinal scan and again this retinal scan is repeated 28 weeks the patient will be seen every two weekly between the obstetrician and the endocrinologist and the bp has to be measured at every visit why because there is two times increased risk of preeclampsia what is the intrapartum management if she is a gestational diabetes which means that she has developed diabetes in the pregnancy you will deliver her by 40 weeks 6 days because the complication is going to be lesser but if the patient is a known case of diabetes type 1 or type 2 then you will induce her or do cesarean section by 37 to 38 weeks of period of gestation throughout delivery you have to monitor the patient's blood sugar levels and it is kept at 80 to 140 mg per deciliter so if the patient is on insulin and you are going to induce the patient the night dose of intermediate insulin is planned but the morning dose is going to be withheld if the patient is in active labor we have to maintain the blood sugar between 80 to 140 right so if it goes less than 70 then we will start with dextrose coming back to the question what is false in a patient being planned for induction of labor the night dose is given as planned and the morning dose is withheld yes rbs is maintained between 80 to 140 yes blood sugar monitoring levels fasting is kept at 95 1 hour at 140 2 hours at 120 yes elective cesarean section has no role in reducing the incidence of brachial plexus injury now brachial plexus injury is seen in which case in shoulder dystocia So, if the baby is macrosomic and the mother is diabetic, then we go for elective cesarean section, and therefore this option is wrong. All our criteria of over diabetes in pregnancy. What do we mean by over diabetes? That the patient was having diabetes before she got pregnant. So, this is the criteria: RBS more than two hundred, HbA one c more than six point five, fasting blood sugar more than one twenty six. This is also your medicine question, and they have been asking this repeatedly. You just need to mug up these values. There are no two ways about it. So this is our answer. As per DIPSI, patient is said to have gestational diabetes at what random blood sugar value? So the screening of diabetes is done by two methods: one step approach, which is DIPSI and WHO, and two step approach, which is by ACOG. So in ACOG approach, what we were doing? We were doing GCT, and on GCT, if the blood sugar level was coming out to be high, then we were going for oral glucose tolerance test. So this was a really hectic and a long procedure. DIPSI came out with a method. Where we give patient seventy five grams of glucose irrespective of the fasting status. The patient is not supposed to fast in this, and we take a single sample after two hours. Okay, so if the sample after two hours is less than one twenty, we need not worry. If it is more than one forty, then it is a case of gestational diabetes. If it is more than two hundred, then it's a case of over diabetes which had not been maybe diagnosed earlier. As per the DIPSI value, the patient is said to be diabetic if the RBS is more than one forty. What is the most specific? The question over here is what is the most specific, not most common? Most specific congenital malformation seen in babies with diabetic females. So first of all, the most common system which is involved is the cardiovascular system. The most common anomaly is the ventricular septal defect, and the most specific here is TGA. okay the second most common system which is involved is the central nervous system here the most common anomaly is anencephaly or spina bifida and the most specific is caudal regression syndrome or sacral agenesis if they were to ask what is the overall most specific then overall also most specific is your caudal regression syndrome so coming back to the question this is going to be your option a second gravid at 36 weeks presents to opd with blood pressure 150 by 105 okay 
urine dipstick 3 plus which means she is preeclamptic all are symptoms of imminent eclampsia except so let's go through the explanation first the signs of end organ damage or imminent eclampsia are the same so don't get confused in between this it's very simple thrombocytopenia platelet count less than 1 lakh you just need to remember this entire table renal insufficiency when the creatinine level is more than 1.1 or doubling of the baseline they have asked each and every point from the table liver involvement where the serum transaminase level is twice the normal also, there is epigastric pain, cerebral symptoms, headache, blurring of vision, convulsions, hyperreflexia and pulmonary edema. Also, a few important points on hypertension in pregnancy. So, what is gestational hypertension? When the blood pressure is more than equal to 140 by 90 millimeters of mercury, on two occasions, four hours apart, after 20 weeks of pregnancy and it resolves by 12 weeks postpartum. So, if the blood pressure has been high before 20 weeks of pregnancy, and it is not resolving even 12 weeks after postpartum, it will not be gestational hypertension. Okay. What is preeclampsia? Preeclampsia is nothing but gestational hypertension plus presence of protein in urine. Okay. What is eclampsia? Eclampsia is a patient with preeclampsia plus seizures. What is chronic hypertension? That the patient has increased blood pressure before 20 weeks of pregnancy and it is not getting resolved even after 12 weeks postpartum. And what is chronic hypertension plus preeclampsia? So, remember one thing that preeclampsia is hypertension with protein in urine. So, the patient will have protein in urine and signs of end organ damage will be there. But the patient will be having raised blood pressure even before 20 weeks of pregnancy. So, coming back to the question, again, it's an answer of exclusion. Will the patient have headache? Yes. Blurring of vision? Yes. Persistent epigastric pain? Yes. Fetal edema? Well, this is a physiological sign of pregnancy. So, this is also a very common sense question and this is going to be the answer. Which of the following is false regarding magnesium sulfate? Let's go through the explanation first. So, magnesium sulfate was given as a MAGPI trial and the mechanism of action is that it has a central inhibitory effect. You need to remember these things. It inhibits glutamate and it activates adenosine and it blocks the NMDA receptors. Okay, these are some fancy names but you just need to mark these up. And it decreases motor and plate sensitivity to acetylcholine. In addition to this, it is a vasodilator, it blocks the calcium channel and therefore it cannot be given along with other calcium channel blockers, okay, like nifedipine. It increases the blood flow to the brain, uterus and kidney since it's a vasodilator. It is also a mild tocolytic. So, let's go through the options which is false. Magnesium sulfate causes uterine relaxation. Yes, it is a tocolytic. It is continued up to 24 hours after delivery or last attack of seizure. Yes. In renal failure, the loading dose has to be adjusted. We are aware that it affects the kidney and we need to adjust the dose. Yes. It has excitatory effect on cerebral cortex. No. It has inhibitory effect. What is the first sign of magnesium toxicity? This is a very straightforward question. The therapeutic level of magnesium sulfate is 4 to 7 milli equivalents per liter. You need to remember this. And the first thing which goes is the knee jerk or the patellar reflex. When the magnesium levels reach, 10 milli equivalents per liter. The respiratory depression follows that, followed by the cardiac arrest. What is the contraindication of magnesium sulfate? So, the contraindication is myasthenia gravis and deranged renal function. What is the antidote for magnesium toxicity? Antidote is 10 milligram injection of 10% calcium gluconate or calcium chloride. So, the first sign of magnesium toxicity is loss of knee jerk. Now, next question, which of the following does not fit into the theories of causation of preeclampsia? Well, this looks like a very scary question. Lot of text is here. So, even if you don't know it, let's try to solve it by a general knowledge. So, prostaglandins play an important role. Thromboxane A2 decreases. First of all, in preeclampsia, all of us know that there is vasospasm, which means that the artery is constricting. Okay. So, thromboxane A2, all of us know is a vasoconstrictor. It should ideally be increasing. Here it says that it decreases. So, this raises a query in my mind. Endothelial cell dysfunction leads to reduce nitric oxide level and it causes preeclampsia. Well, nitric oxide is what? A vasodilator. So, the level is reducing. Yes, the level can reduce in preeclampsia. It seems right. Vasoconstriction can lead to ischemia, necrosis, hemorrhage, and organ damage. Yes, end organ damage is seen in preeclampsia and can lead to ischemia. This also seems fine. Anti-angiogenic factors play an important role. They can be increase in SFLT1 and PGF, decrease in PGF. Well, these are again few fancy names. I have doubt about these. I don't know whether what increases or what decreases. But I am very sure that thromboxane A2 should be increasing, right? Because it's a vasoconstrictor. So, my guess will be option number A. Let's go through the solution. In normal pregnancy, what happens is that the vasodilator effects predominates the vasoconstrictor effect. What are the vasodilators? 
नाइट्रिक ऑक्साइड प्रोस्टोग्लैंडिन एंड बीईजीएफ ओके वैस्कुलर एंडोथेलियल ग्रोथ फैक्टर और ग्रोथ फैक्टर्स आर जनरली वेजोडाइलेटर्स व्हाट इज वेजोकोंस्ट्रिक्टर एंजियोटेंसिन 2 इज अ वेजोकोंस्ट्रिक्टर नाउ इन प्री इक्लैम्पिया टू थिंग्स आर हैपनिंग व्हाट इज द मेन पैथोजेनेसिस वेजोस्पाज्म एंड एंडोथेलियल इंजरी सो आई हैव सिंपलीफाइड दिस ऑल इन वन चार्ट एंडोथेलियल इंजरी कैन बी बिकॉज़ ऑफ ऑक्सीडेटिव स्ट्रेस ऑल योर लिपिड पेरोक्साइड सुपरऑक्साइड रेडिकल्स TNF alpha cytokines IL6 we know that interleukins and cytokines they lead to endothelial injury vasospasm where the vasoconstrictor effects predominates so the, what were the vasoconstrictors angiotensin 2 SFLT1 endoglin 1 is also vasoconstrictor thromboxane A2 and endothelin is also vasoconstrictor nitric oxide prostaglandin and BEGF they are vasodilators so if you not able to remember the fancy names of vasoconstrictor just remember these things that only the vasodilators are nitric oxide prostaglandin and vascular endothelial growth factor so therefore this is going to be our answer a patient who is 35 plus 5 weeks presents with complaints of altered sensorium which means that the brain is getting affected somewhere blood pressure is 170 by 110 so what was the blood pressure for gestational hypertension more than 140 by 100 mmhg right on two occasions four hours apart three plus proteinuria which means it's a pre eclampsia wherever there is proteinuria by more than 1 plus is pre eclampsia she is 3 cm dilated 50 60 percent effaced what will you be your next step we can see that she has progressed in her labor also so let's go through the solution the main principle in management i have simplified it you just need to remember this thing that if the diastolic blood pressure is more than 100 or the systolic is more than 150 you need to start antihypertensive so if the blood pressure is 150 by 80 suppose you will start antihypertensive Yes. If the blood pressure is 130 by 100 mmHg diastolic, will you start? Yes. If the blood pressure is more than 160 by 110, or the proteinuria starts coming, which means all patients of pre-eclampsia, you will admit them in the hospital. Now, whichever gestation you are going to admit them, because we need to carry out certain investigations. Okay. And in all signs of impending eclampsia, you are going to start magnesium sulfate. So basically, this is the crux of management of hypertension in pregnancy. Another important point: time of delivery. If the patient has gestational hypertension. we can take her to 37 weeks but if she is preeclamptic which means proteinuria 1 plus plus gestational hypertension we will deliver her between 34 to 36 plus 6 weeks so coming back to the question the patient is having 3 plus proteinuria in preeclampsia what is the definition 1 plus proteinuria but here she is having 3 plus which means she is a severe case also the blood pressure is 170 by 110 which is severe preeclampsia and when do we deliver them between 34 to 36 plus 6 she is 35 plus 5 so ideally we have to terminate her pregnancy and we have to deliver her will you do conservative management no tocolytic why no not needed steroid again not needed she is 35 plus 5 weeks magnesium sulfate management of hypertension termination of pregnancy yes so therefore this is the option of choice this brings us to the end of discussion next time we'll be discussing how to read ctg and infections in pregnancy